In April of 1834, the House of Representatives voted 134 to 82 against rechartering the bank. This was followed up by an even more lopsided vote to establish a special committee to investigate whether the bank had caused the crash. When the investigating committee arrived at the bank's door in Philadelphia, armed with a subpoena to examine the books, Biddle refused to give them up, nor would he allow inspection of correspondence with congressmen relating to their personal loans and advances he'd made to them. He also refused to testify before the committee back in Washington. On January 8th, 1835, Jackson paid off the final installment on the national debt, which had been necessitated by allowing the banks to issue currency for government bonds rather than simply issuing treasury notes without such debt. He was the only president to ever pay off the debt. A few weeks later, on January 30th, 1835, an assassin by the name of Richard Lawrence tried to shoot President Jackson. But by the grace of God, both pistols misfired. Lawrence was later found not guilty by reason of insanity. After his release, he bragged to friends that powerful people in Europe had put him up to the task and promised to protect him if he were caught. The following year, when its charter ran out, the Second Bank of the United States ceased functioning as the nation's central bank. Biddle was later arrested and charged with fraud. He was tried and acquitted, but died shortly thereafter while still tied up in civil suits. After his second term as president, Jackson retired here to the Hermitage outside of Nashville to live out his life. He is still remembered here for his determination to kill the bank. In fact, he killed it so well that it took the money changers 77 years to undo the damage. When asked what his most important accomplishment had been, Jackson replied, I killed the bank. Unfortunately, even Jackson failed to grasp the entire picture and its root cause. Although Jackson had killed the central bank, the most insidious weapon of the money changers, fractional reserve banking, remained in use by the numerous state chartered banks. This fueled economic instability in the years before the Civil War. Still, the central bankers were out, and as a result, America thrived as it expanded westward. During this time, the principal money changers struggled to regain their lost centralized power, but to no avail. Then, finally, they reverted to the old central banker's formula, war to create debt and dependency. If they couldn't get their central bank any other way, America could be brought to its knees by plunging it into a civil war, just as they had done in 1812 after the first bank of the United States was not rechartered. One month after the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, the first shots of the American Civil War were fired here at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, on April 12, 1861. Certainly slavery was a cause for the Civil War, but not the primary cause. Lincoln knew that the economy of the South depended upon slavery, and so before the Civil War, he had no intention of eliminating it. Lincoln had put it this way in his inaugural address only one month earlier. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it now exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Even after the first shots were fired here at Fort Sumter, Lincoln continued to insist that the Civil War was not about the issue of slavery. My paramount objective is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. So what was the Civil War all about? There were many factors at play. Northern industrialists had used protective tariffs to prevent the southern states from buying cheaper European goods. Europe retaliated by stopping cotton imports from the south. 
the southern states were in a double financial bind. They were forced to pay more for most of the necessities of life while their income from cotton exports plummeted. The South was angry. But there were other factors at work. The money changers were still stung by America's withdrawal from their control 25 years earlier. Since then, America's wildcat economy had made the nation rich, a bad example for the rest of the world. The central bankers now saw an opportunity to split the rich new nation, to divide and conquer by war. Was this just some sort of wild conspiracy theory at the time? Well, let's take a look at what a well-placed observer of the scene had to say at the time. His name was Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, the man who united the German states a few years later. The division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained as one bloc and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence which would upset their financial domination over the world. Within months after the first shots here at Fort Sumter, the central bankers loaned Napoleon III of France, the nephew of the Waterloo Napoleon, 210 million francs to seize Mexico and station troops along the southern border of the U.S., taking advantage of their war to violate the Monroe Doctrine and return Mexico to colonial rule. No matter what the outcome of the Civil War, a weakened America, heavily indebted to the money changers, would open up Central and South America once again to European colonization and domination the very thing America's Monroe Doctrine had forbade in 1823. At the same time, Great Britain moved 11,000 troops into Canada and positioned them menacingly along America's northern border. The British fleet went to war alert should their quick intervention be called for. Lincoln knew he was in a double bind. That's why he agonized over the fate of the Union. There was a lot more to it than just differences between the North and the South. That's why his emphasis was always on union and not merely the defeat of the South. But Lincoln needed money to win. In 1861, Lincoln and his Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, went to New York to apply for the necessary loans. The money changers, anxious to see the union fail, offered loans at 24 to 36% interest. Lincoln said thanks, but no thanks, and returned to Washington. Lincoln sent for an old friend, Colonel Dick Taylor of Chicago, and put him on the problem of financing the war. During one meeting, Lincoln asked Taylor what he discovered. Taylor put it this way. Why, Lincoln, that is easy. Just get Congress to pass a bill authorizing the printing of full legal tender treasury notes and pay your soldiers with them, and go ahead and win your war with them also. When Lincoln asked if the people of the United States would accept the notes, Taylor said, the people or anyone else will not have any choice in the matter if you make them full legal tender. They will have the full sanction of the government and be just as good as any money as Congress is given that express right by the Constitution. So that's exactly what Lincoln did. In 1862-63, he printed up $450 million worth of the new bills. In order to distinguish them from other banknotes in circulation, he printed them in green ink on the back side. That's why the notes were called greenbacks. With this new money, Lincoln paid the troops and bought their supplies. During the course of the war, nearly $450 million worth of greenbacks were printed at no interest to the federal government.